Hello and good morning from Scotland, from the UK. My name's Gary Robinson and welcome to Tigers and Teddies Live. It's our second, if you like, uh, foray into, into this uh, with uh, the wonderful, I have to say, Suzanne Zedai. Good morning, Suzanne. Good morning, Gary. Um, you're in you're in Bonnie Scotland too. I've got to say we've got the. I don't know where everyone else is, but we've certainly got the weather this morning, which is <laughs> which is uh, makes everybody's mood uh, much lighter, doesn't it? It's brilliant weather. I hope wherever everybody else is, they've got good weather too. Before we get uh, into the the, the nitty gritty uh, of uh, of this morning's vodcast, if you like, Suzanne, we launched the book this what? little number two weeks ago. Uh, what's the response been like so far? It's been fabulous. We've had so much interest in the kinds of insights that um, understanding attachment gives you and in the wide ways that you can use this. And in fact, when we launched the book uh, two weeks ago, we hadn't planned to have a whole series, but it was only because of all of the enthusiasm that people sent back afterwards that we thought there's quite a lot of energy for this. So we should really find a way to extend that. So we've, we just decided that we would have a whole summer series of this kind of these insights and to really give a platform for a lot more voices besides mine and just extend the energy that we had last time. That's a lovely cue, actually. I'll be introducing our wonderful guests uh, in, just a, in just a moment or two. Um, the uh, topic for this morning couldn't be any more timely, particularly for our friends south of the border uh, in England, as uh, children, some children, are going back to school, uh, going back to those uh, learning environments as of Monday. Uh, your Twitter feed has been on meltdown, I think it's fair to say. My Twitter feed, Gary. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, it has. And um, Connected Baby. And Connected, yes. Um, mm -hmm. And lots of other people's Twitter feeds because with English schools going back on Monday, there's a lot of um, interest in what's the best way to support the children? What do they need in order to, to feel calm and to start to reconnect? Because this has really been a time of disconnection and anxiety for a lot of children. And there is some concern that not all schools um, feel confident about addressing the emotional needs, that some schools are really going to concentrate on behavior or are going to jump back quickly into learning. And so there's a big discussion going on at the moment about really paying attention to children's emotional needs and their stress levels and being trauma informed really helps with that. Well, I can see the chat uh, it has started uh, predictably early, as you can imagine. So please, if you're viewing this and you want to contribute a comment or you want to talk to each other, as many people did on our first vodcast when we launched the book two weeks ago, please do. Uh, lots of people from all over the UK. We've got Livingston, we've got Northern Ireland, we've got Aberdeen, uh, all saying good morning to us. So keep them coming uh, and keep those comments coming as well. It would be good to, to hear from you throughout the morning. Uh, and good morning to uh, Jacqueline from Glasgow, the borders, five gosh, <laughs> they're all, all there this morning. Uh, right, okay, so let's move on to our guests. Uh, and first of all, could I say hello and good morning to Eileen, Eileen Brennan. Good morning, Eileen. Good morning, Gary. You look very festive there. I'm <laughs> loving the balloons and I'm loving, I've got Teddy Envy, by the way. <laughs> I've got two. Because, uh, There's more. <laughs> I bet there is, but I, I, a lot of, I brought my Dermot uh, last uh, two weeks ago, so he's he's back. Uh, so I've got Teddy Envy. It's looking good. Uh, you're the head teacher uh, of uh, our Lady of Lords uh, Roman Catholic uh, Primary School. So good morning and welcome, Eileen. Uh, and we'll be chatting to you fairly shortly. Uh, the lovely uh, Angela Gardner is with us. Good morning to you, Angela. Good morning, Gary. Good morning. And Angela is the head of uh, St. John the Baptist Roman Catholic Primary School. Uh, and uh, I'm loving your teddy. What's the name of your teddy in the background there? So this is just, this is, this is, um, this one here is, oh, is a too. memory bear. Um, yeah. <clears throat> is a memory bear that was um, made for my children, but, um, for, my, for my dad. Um, and the other one is just one that I've had for a long, long, long time. One of my friends um, at uni gave it to me. 
Oh, it's lovely. It's lovely. Well, welcome to the show. It's good to see you. And finally, Francis Burns is from St. Joseph's Roman Catholic Primary School, uh, Whitburn, uh, the head there. Francis, good morning to you. Good morning, Ali. So good to see you. I can see you've got your teddy there. Yes. Uh, any story? Yeah. On? This, book. this <laughs> actually belongs to my granddaughter. Um, it's Ava Bear, and she has it when she stays here. So we're missing Ava at the moment. So this is her little bear. Wonderful. Well, it's so good to have uh, have you ladies on. Suzanne, if I can come back to you for a second. How do you know our guests? Because they feature in the book, and I'm going to read a little bit um, in just a moment. But did the ladies feature in the first edition, or did you put them in the second? No, there were no stories in the first edition of the book. Okay. In the second edition of the book that I thought there are a lot of stories I would like to share of how people have put this information into action and the the story of what I call my teddy bear schools is absolutely one of those I wanted to tell. Well this is it uh, and I'll read I'll read this is on page 52 there you go look at that it's beautifully illustrated I've got to say uh, Suzanne it really is stories of professional change so Eileen Francis and Angela's story uh, as primary school head teachers. And I'll just read a little bit. In 2017, three teachers, Eileen Francis and Angela, got together to explore how attachment awareness could be woven throughout the culture of their primary schools. The result was their teddy bear policies. It took a little bit of courage to publicly proclaim that title, given the contrast between its casual tone and the formal language in which educational policies are usually written. However, within two years, their approach was being praised in national publications. So well, let's go on to that. And Eileen, um, how, did, how did your teddy bear policy come about? So um, it all came about from our work with Suzanne. Um, when um, the Scottish Government um, allocated the PEF money, we were thinking about our schools were all quite similar and we were finding similar experiences with the children we were working with. And um, we have probably all been around the block quite a few times in terms of dealing with behaviour. Um, and so we were looking for a different approach. And when we met with Suzanne, and she's got a saber tooth tigers and teddy bears, our conversation we decided that teddy bear policies would be the way we wanted to go thinking about the children's inner teddy bear and thinking about how to look after that to care for that um, and to make it feel secure so it kind of came from that thinking about behavior and Suzanne when you were working on this um, did you choose the language you know teddy, teddy bear uh, policies did, was that was that your language that was that your initiative or something that the schools had adopted no, it absolutely wasn't my language to have teddy bear policies. Um, although I talk about saber tooth tigers and teddy bears, it was the you know it was the staff themselves. It was Francis and Angela and Eileen who wanted to use that language to talk about policies and the courage that it you know lots of people have behavior policies, but the idea that you would have teddy bear policies is really different and that's where the courage lay I think in their choosing to have that language. So Francis if I could come to you based on that what what sort of challenges did you find uh, as a head in the uh, in the early days of implementing the policy if you like? It was the, the initial broaching of it um, we had a behaviour policy which and a, a reward system whereby children were on a chart and it was changing from that chart. If I walked into the room, I could see immediately who was on a green card, who was on a, a red or an amber card. And, and we just felt it was a bit of humiliation because it was the same children in the same place all the time, even though everyone started a clean sheet every day. And we just felt it wasn't working. However, it, it was a management system that the staff were quite comfortable with. And when we started talking about um, clearing space and building relationships and giving time to talk and taking time out with the children to find out why are they behaving in this way, what is going on in their lives. Um, they don't choose to come in in the morning and, and be in a bad mood and make everyone suffer. So it was about digging deeper. And the concern was this is going to take time from the curriculum. It's going to take time from the learning. How do we justify that? Um, and it was getting the staff to buy into this is a longer term strategy and it's about giving the children time, space 
um, to listen to them and to build resilience within them so that throughout life they will have this to fall back on. So for me, that was the biggest challenge. Um, and then how are we going to broach this with the parents? What are they going to think? Are they going to think we are mad? Um, teddy bear policies, you know, what's this all about? Will they engage? Um, however, it, it, did, it did take off really well and it did um, show quick results. So that helps to move it forward. Wonderful. Let's come back to that in a moment, Francis, and look at some of those, uh, those tangible results as we go through. Um, Angela, good morning to you once again. Um, what about the early adoption of your teddy bear policies? How, how was it? How did it come about and how did you find it? What, were there any, any challenges? So I think it, for us, it was about um, this focus away from behaviour. I think in staff rooms across the land, teachers continually talk about behaviour and it's all that we talk about sometimes. So it was, you know, just looking at that word behaviour and just kind of putting it to the side for a minute um, and looking at our relationships with our children, looking at what our, what our children's barriers to learning are and how we can address those. So it was a big focus on getting it right for every child and looking at each child as an individual rather than um, producing this blanket approach across the school, um, like Francis was talking about with those behaviour strategies and things that we used in classrooms before. It was now looking at what does this individual need and how can we support their needs and what do we need to do? Um, so was that that changing away from the word behaviour and getting getting rid of our behaviour policy and producing our positive relationships policy? And it was really challenging at the start, um, especially for me as an, I was an acting head teacher in a new school. Obviously, you want to try and impress your, your um, senior leaders and the, and the authority and you're looking to... Um, and then if I was to start talking to them about teddy bear policies, Again, like Francis says, they might think I was mad. So for the first maybe few months, I started, I would say teddy bear policy quickly followed by positive relationships policy, um, just so that people under, understood what it was I meant by that. Um, and as Francis said, we started beginning the work with our parents um, and with our children. And it was our children who came up with their own teddy bear policy. And our staff, when they did their teddy bear policy, it was about their promise to our children. So things like a hand to hold, a shoulder to lean on, um, a fresh start every day. Um, these were all things that our staff were, were making a promise to our children. Can I just come in, sorry Gary, and just say there that also when we were presented to staff, we spoke to staff about how would they like to be treated um, if they were having a bad morning, if they threw something down in a rage, would they be expected to be sent to the head teacher's office or would they expect someone to say to them what's happening, what's wrong, can I help you? So we kind of presented it to staff that way as well. For me, just going back as well, um, a kind of lightning bolt moment, not even a light bulb moment, was when I went to um, a, a thing that Suzanne had put on in Edinburgh and there was another head teacher speaking there called Jennifer Nusson and she spoke about how behaviour was communication and, and I know that sounds so obvious but I just when she said that behaviour is communication it just hit home to me that exactly that is what it is if we look at our children and their behaviour and become really curious about it we find out there's reasons, there's triggers for these behaviours, and that's all part of what our teddy bear policies are about as well. It's about understanding and being curious about behaviour. Well, we, we know Jennifer well, and uh, uh, hopefully she'll be, be, be viewing this as, uh, as, as we speak. And if you are watching it, uh, good morning, Jennifer. Suzanne, do these three stories uh, have, a, have a resemblance of, um, of, uh, of a pattern? So, so with other schools and with other um, educational establishments and with, with, uh, with educators that you've spoken to, are these stories quite similar? So the stories that these ladies have shared, is it, is it across the board? Yes. In our country, we have an emphasis on behavior. And that's how people get trained to think. That's how parents think. We pay attention to behavior in our children and we respond to that. Well, I love about every single school who tries to become trauma-informed or attachment-led or with a teddy bear policy or with positive relationships, whatever language you choose, what they're doing is trying to pay attention to children's feelings, not just their behavior. And that turns out to be a new idea for lots of people. And the reason that that matters is because feelings are based in the body. 
right? So if a child is scared or a child is tense, that's based in their biology. And then that's going to drive their behavior. And we just don't have that general awareness in our culture. And so it's a shift of mindset. It's like a cultural shift to start to get interested in children's feelings. Nobody has to mean to ignore them in order for that to happen, which is why I love every story of, you know, the lightning bolt stories and the, the light bulb moment stories gives people permission not to have known this and then gives them permission to get more curious about it. Because if I say one more thing, what you come to realize is that we decontextualize children's behavior. We do not contextualize it emotionally. It doesn't matter how you're feeling. I'm just interested in how you behave. And that's not kind. And it's not helpful. And it makes everything worse. So what the teddy bear policies did was recontextualize children's behavior within an emotional context. And that's a really big shift. And it's one I totally celebrate. And it's one that is happening across the land, but it hasn't reached everybody yet. When, when we were trying to share with our staff this, it was really quite difficult to broach that. And then we had the viewing of the resilience film. And Eileen talks about her lightning bolt moment. For my staff, the majority of them, that was the lightning bolt moment. Um, when, when they looked at the film, the content of the film, and Everyone was talking about their ACEs. It happens to everyone. We've all got ACEs. We've all had experiences. So for me, that was a big driver in moving the culture and the change within the school. What is it that you think that people don't get that that, that film helped them to get? Like, what is the gap in our cultural understanding that this is new for people? What do you think that is? Talking about feelings, talking about their own experiences and things that have happened in their lives and um, trauma is something that happens to someone else and it should be dealt with in private, it shouldn't be shared or talked about. But when, when we had discussions after the viewing of the film, people were opening up about their own lives and it was very much a voluntary thing um, and realising that perhaps their life has gone down a certain course because of things that happened early on. Um, and from that came the, the, the desire to change that for our children. Because you maybe had a, a rough start in life does not determine who you will be. And that was a big change. Aha. Uh -huh. I just picked <laughs> on one comment that I've seen in the chat box. Some people have said, what's the resilience film? I love that question. So resilience is a film about adverse childhood experiences, shortened to ACEs, which some of you have used this morning, that language, but that might be new to people. It's made by KPJR Films, and it, had a, it was very popular across Scotland in 2017. It, we just hit a really big explosion of interest in showing that hour-long film which is about adverse childhood experiences. And um, lots of communities wanted to see it. And your guys' community was one of that. You showed it to lots of parents. You showed it to all the staff. And what I think it does is it helps people to better understand how behavior is being driven underneath by biology. It, and it is kind of remarkable how it creates curiosity, that film. That's what you're saying, Francis. Yes, yes. And empathy as well. It created empathy because the, st the staff and the community began to identify children's behaviour and then looked at the, the bigger picture, the, what was going on in the child's life, and they began to understand and unpick why that child was coming in in the morning in such a mood or, you know, you could then understand this behaviour as communication better. Yeah. And I think after that, it was really <clears throat> the once they understood how the children were feeling, then they would say, um, it, would, it would deter them, I think, from, from the, the punishments that were maybe inflicted upon them before, um, because they, they could um, empathize with how the children were feeling. Um, and that way, that's how we kind of got away from all the, the sanctions around behavior. And that was a real shift in the culture of the school. And the language as well that we were using was changing as well. We we're talking about distressed child rather than badly behaved. 
Um, so a big shift in the language. I think the minute you use the, the word distressed, um, referring to a child and their behaviour, it immediately changes the way you feel and the way you want to approach that behaviour. That, thank you for that. Suzanne, I want to come back to, to the word behaviour because you, not just with this series, uh, and we've done numerous podcasts, uh, audio podcasts, with, uh, with uh, educational leaders across the board. Um, why, why are we as a country, not in all cases, obviously, because we've got three examples of great practice here, but why are we still hooked into the behaviour word when we're talking about children in schools? Why, why, why can't we seem to get over that in certain areas? Gary, I'm laughing. Why are we still hooked into the behavior word? That's like saying, why does the sun come up? Why do we want to eat? It's so embedded in the way we see things that lots of people don't even know you can question it. Okay, and that's just the way cultures are. Cultures make things normal and you can't see that they could ever be different or that there could be any problems with them, whatever's normal, we think is okay. So, like most schools have a behavior policy. What happens if a child does something that is deemed to be bad behavior, what will happen? What are the sanctions that will happen? The idea that you would have something other than a behavior policy just sounds weird to lots of schools. And in fact, it sounds scary because what would you do if we don't have a behavior policy? You've got classrooms of 30 or more children. That takes a lot of management. And so our culture just thinks that what you do is punish children. That's also what lots of parents think. You know, their whole television programs about put children on the naughty step. Um, Until the 1980s, schools strapped children. We had corporal punishment. We for children who misbehaved in schools. And that was a big fight to change that. So I think your question is really important and valuable, but it's one we really need to reflect on. Why do we put our focus on behavior? And once you really ask that, you can think, well, it probably goes back a long time. It probably it probably has some religious beginnings given how deeply embedded Um, religion has been in human history about how you deal with human relationships. Well, then that goes back a long, long way if it has religious beginnings, given that lots of people now don't have a, you know, a religious affiliation. So treating that as a really serious question about what, what is our focus on behavior? And also, why have we so often beat children in the past? We do less of that now. But it's only last year that we brought in a law in Scotland that said you couldn't hit children. We, we thought that that was okay. And even that was a big debate. So this shift with this little light language of teddy bear policies, which sounds sweet and twee and maybe not serious enough, is actually a major shift. And that's why I love the courage of these three schools to embrace this language of teddy bear policies, which if you, you know, teddy bears are about comfort. Even if you don't really know what a teddy bear policy is, it already signals that we're shifting to something about reassurance and comfort. And that's a really different place to start than behavior. So some schools are back uh, in England on, on Monday. Yeah. Um, what, what are the big concerns so you know we've had children who've been off for two months plus they've been working in different environments some people have been homeschooled uh some people have been i would imagine sharing their parents stress i mean there's been all sorts of things going on in individual households right across the country what is the worry uh, is if we take children uh, from now and then put them back into school on monday as if nothing's happened let my colleagues tell you. Francis. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the worry is that we try to catch up with lost learning before reconnecting, re-establishing relationships, allowing the children the space and the time to talk about their experience, what's been good, what's not been good, um, giving them someone that will listen and not judge. 
um, and just allowing them to feel comfortable because the children will have had a lot of anxiety. Some may have had loss or bereavement. There will possibly be financial constraints in the family. So there's an awful lot that we need to support um, and, and just allow them to relax. They will be anxious about coming back because you know this germ that they're all worried about, they're all anxious about, where is it? Is it still there? So our, our main focus when we come back will be about reconnecting, um, listening. Um, we, we have detect, sort of detected, um, decided sorry, to focus on health and well-being and a big part of that being mental um, health and well-being until October. When, when we come back, we will be learning, but the focus will be about relationships and about um, health and wellbeing learning. Um, and then we will reassess where we are and gradually ease into the curriculum as we feel the children are ready to do that. Um, there's a lot of work to do first. I'm going to share that uh, that question again uh, with, with Eileen and, and with Angela. Uh, mm-hmm. Eileen, what, what about you when the children eventually come back? What, what stance are you going to be taking? Um, just exactly the same as what um, Francis was saying. I think the staff have a lot of concerns as well about returning and about all the rules about distancing. And um, of course, that's very much forefront in everything we're going to be doing. But we're already planning, just as Francis was talking about, um, what it's going to look like. We're in a really good position, though, because we have been working in that kind of way already for such a long time. It has always been about health and well-being for us. Um, it's always been top number one um, thing in our um, schools. And so we've already, the things that we'd be putting into place um, around the emotion, um, emotional change would be there already. We already do check-ins with the children. Um, we're going to have to change a lot of things we've got because, as we said before, we've got all these teddies around our schools. So we're going to have to change our approach to them. But the teddy bears won't be going. Um, how we work with the teddy bears will be changing. Okay, that's interesting. I want to come on to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I because just it- feel sorry that the teddy bears or teddy bear policies are um, just make it so much easier for us because that was the way we were working anyway. Okay. And Angela, um, yeah. uh, to you as well about your school. Yeah, I would say um, our teddy bear policies are not so much, they're, they're about who we are as, as much as what we do. So, you know, what our, what our values are as teachers and, and head teachers and, and, and our staff share a lot of that too. So I think it's it's just about supporting our children and, you know, as we, as we have for the last three years and, and we're in a really good place where we have got built up a lot of strategies and, and resources and, and ways of doing things over the last three years that are really going to be um, pivotal in turning things around this time. Um, and I think kit bag is going to be one of those as well um, from Children First. That is, it's been such a huge thing in our school and our children have really loved using it. Um, and it's really supported their emotional well-being. And I think kit bag is going to play a big part when we go back because our children ask for it quite often when they're, they're feeling up upset or emotional about something they will ask us to do a kit bag so you know I think that's one of the first things that we'll be focusing on when we go back. So Suzanne uh, lots of questions actually coming up on that now for people who aren't familiar with kit bag could you tell us briefly what it is? Angela you tell people what kit bag is because you've been so creative in how you use it. <laughs> so Kit bag is is just a tool. It's it's, it's a talking tool, really, um, and how we can um, support our children. It's got little, you know, it's made by Children First. It's got um, little bits and pieces in it that allow children to talk about their feelings, to talk about why they're feeling the way they're feeling, and also to support each other in that. Um, and children um, support each other with their emotions and and how to manage those, and um, with kindness and, and compassion for other people. And um, you know, it, it's been so successful that we we had a child who moved to another school. They moved out of the village, and actually, uh, that I had a head teacher call me from another school saying this child um, has come to our school and he's asking if we can do kit bag with him. What is that? So that just shows you how powerful it was for that child to move to another school and and then you know ask if they could have a kit bag session because that's what they really needed. Suzanne, a question just so I just want to tackle a question that's coming in there. Um, somebody's asked, is kit bag suitable for early years? Yes. Okay. So, kit bag is a, to just follow up and reinforce what Angela has just said. And in fact, if I go all the way back to what Francis said, 
Francis said earlier that this is about emotions, about talking about emotions. And Francis, you said that you think that that's our big challenge as a culture, is that we're not great at talking about emotions. And so one big solution in all of this is that we need to get better at talking about emotions and we might need help with that. So Kitbag is a tool that Children First, which is a children's charity, has talked about a lot. It's actually made by International Futures Forum and they were making kit bag tools, but a lot of people didn't know about it until Children First started talking about it. And now more and more and more people have picked it up and just, so I can see happening in the chat, what's kit bag, what's kit bag? I've never heard of kit bag. That's okay, that's what has happened across Scotland is that people have just asked as they've heard about it to, to know more. And so if you're sitting out there thinking, I don't know what kit bag is, well, welcome to the club of people who are learning. And kit bag is a little bag, it's about that size, and it's full of things like, it's got some cards in it, it's got some little puppets in it, um, it's got some calming oils in it. So it's nothing fancy, it doesn't look very rocket science, and yet it, those tools, those emotion cards, the animal cards, are just tools that help children to talk about feelings and help adults to do that with them. It's suitable for any age. I know organizations that are using it at board meetings to open up conversation, and I know nurseries that use it. So you can use it in all sorts of different ways. It's really flexible, and that's one of its, I suppose that's one of its strengths. And the stories that you've just given, Angela, of children who come to really use it as a tool to help them talk, illustrate that it becomes kind of part of who they are. And if more schools used it, it's just a help. It's a tool that helps us to get better at talking about emotions, given that we're not very good at that. Would you agree, Francis? Yes, I definitely agree. Our children use kit bag. We also used emotion works. Um, where the children were taught to identify their emotions and then what they might feel when they are in that particular emotion. Um, we used the Disney film as well and, and we, we showed them that film and that helped them to identify the, the emotions they were feeling. Is that inside? Uh, inside, inside out. Out. Yes, we used that. So that was really helpful for helping as a school to look at emotions. Um, we have looked at um, relaxation techniques, aromatherapy techniques, um, when you come into the school, the waiting area where parents or visitors come in, we have aromatherapy going on um, in that reception area. Because sometimes some of our parents or our visitors may be emotional or, or anxious when they come into school, so that just helps. Um, we have, Eileen and I went to a creating therapy space training, and uh, we have our TVs with beautiful landscapes and seascapes as you come into our areas now too, which again just helps to calm. So it's about creating that ethos in your school where we understand you are stressed, let's come in and talk about it, create the space, um, create the time. You may not have the answers, but you're giving the children and you're giving the staff and the wider community a space to come in and, and seek help. Um, and, and it's really working, it's having great effect. Some people might be wondering, well, why does talking about emotions help? Why would that matter? Okay, so if we go all the way back to saber tooth Tigers and Teddy Bear Moments, which is, which is the name of the book, which is essentially about the human stress system. And so what happens is, if we start to feel something, if we're frustrated, if we're scared, if we're irritated, if we're lonely, if we're sad, if we're happy, those are biological states. So they're in our body. So your breath gets fast. So your heart beats hard. So your throat goes tight. So you start to pump um, stress hormones around your body or relaxation hormones around your body. All of that drives behavior. And, and then you have to, so behaviors like an example of the stress that you're feeling underneath. And what being able to put a word to what you're feeling does is help you to understand more about what you're feeling. It helps you to know what you could do to take care of that feeling. 
It helps other people to know how to help. And if we come from a culture that isn't always good at naming feelings and being able to identify them in the body, we make it harder to take care of ourselves. So once you've got a word that says, I'm feeling frustrated, I'm feeling lonely, I'm feeling hungry, it takes the feeling out of your body and it puts it externally. Just having a word means you're not drowning in that feeling. It lets it be a bit external to your body and it lets other people share and it lets other people help. So it becomes really interesting that a simple way to make a big difference to behavior is to help people to have words that describe what they're feeling so that they too know what they're feeling. It's simple, but it's a really profound shift or you guys wouldn't be telling stories about this. Do you think I've described that right, Angela, Francis, Eileen? Yeah. Yep. Say more why. It helps then when the children can identify the emotion, the next step is to ask them, what, what do you think would help you just now? So you're building in the beginnings of self-regulation. They have identified how they feel. They have identified why they feel that way. Um, and then they are being encouraged to find their own solution, which is what we're trying to do in building resilience. Um, so that as they move through life, that's the way they will address difficult situations rather than historically, you know, throwing a, a tantrum or running away or so we're trying to build the self-regulation. Um, and as we've gone through this journey with the children, they, they begin to come to a meeting with you when they've had a difficult day or they come in to talk to you um, and they'll say, right, I'm feeling and I'm feeling because I need 10 minutes to talk to you. And, and this is great because this is what we would be historically dealing with. But they're actually coming in and leading that conversation where Eileen and Angela and I would be the person to say, okay, how are you feeling? So we can see this coming through. And then often when they've had their 10 minutes in the nurture room, they'll come back and say, I'm okay now. I don't need to talk to you. I'm fine. I can go back to the classroom. And when they walk out, you go, yes! <laughs> Because they're, they're self-regulating and they don't need someone external to do it for them. So that's a big success for us. I was just going to say it also helps with co-regulation because there are a lot of children who can't can't self-regulate and and if if you're able to understand how they're feeling and if they can name a feeling then it can help you to co-regulate with them and again it's it's about modeling that to the the staff in the school as well if you can model that co-regulation with the child then they can um, again do that on another occasion when you know when it arises. The, the big great thing that comes from that is now that we're meeting children in the corridor and they're saying oh it's okay I'm just going to do this I'm just going to do that because I'm having a bad time or I was about to kick off in class so we're seeing the results day in day out. I think this is amazing we have people in education who traditionally we have three people here and all their staff traditionally schools talk about behavior they talk about sanctions, they talk about punishment, they, you know, they behavior policies. And what is happening in these three schools is that they are now able to use the language of co-regulation, of regulation, of the emotional regulatory system. That's a, that's a different sh shift. That's different language. That has traditionally been the domain of maybe yoga therapists and um, infant scientists and um, it hasn't been the language of schools. And so when schools can use that with confidence like you guys do and can talk about it to other people, it lets that language travel. It means that there's a different way to understand human behavior than we have traditionally had. And it's a, help, it's a more helpful language. It's kinder. It makes a difference across the whole of life because children's stress systems are actively developing in school. The way they get treated in school will have a biological consequence that will matter for their adulthood. And that actually helps people to realize how really important they are in schools. They're not just teaching children behavior patterns. 
They're actually shaping their biology. It means teachers are hugely important people in children's worlds, if, but not just because they're doing academic learning, because they're actually changing the way their body develops. And it does that through kindness and relationships and um, paying attention to emotions, or else it does that through um, exclusion, rejection, anger. It will do it either way. It, we just don't always realize it. So this helps us to be much more conscious of the way that relationships are impacting on children's development. And it's why I just keep coming back. I'm so enthused by everybody who wants to talk about this. And I'm really grateful to the three of you who've been able to use language like teddy bear policies that make it sound light to do something that's really quite profound. Suzanne, I'd, I'd like to um, touch on um, the, the practical issues of, of next week for the schools that are going back and the issue around social distancing. And I'm sure there'll be some parents, some guardians who are anxious about how that's going to manifest itself in schools. Um, you know, some schools are talking about getting rid of their teddies, no Play-Doh, because we don't want any contamination of, uh, of the things that children use on a daily basis. And even when children get back in the playground, are they going to be able to hug each other? Um, wh wh what's your view on this? I mean, it, it could be, I mean, we could do a, a, a full three or four hours on this, I'm sure. But, but, but what, what's your view and what do you think would be some, uh, some sage advice for next week? Well, I'm going to let my colleagues speak mostly, but if I can frame it, we are in new times and we don't know exactly what they look like, but we can absolutely focus on connecting in these new times instead of focusing on distancing in these new times. So there's something about the language that has lots of adults anxious about how to keep children apart. And that language of social or physical distancing is then what we look for. I think we've got the wrong language. I think we should say, okay, in this new time of physical distancing, how do we promote connection? And that shift of language and shift of mindset has us looking and thinking in different ways. And I know that all three of my colleagues here are doing exactly that kind of thinking. Do you want to tell folks how you're doing that, guys? So if I can go to Angela first on that. Well, I mean, I think, um, I think the good thing is, I mean, I don't know about the English guidance, but the good thing about the Scottish guidance um, for returning to school is that we should be looking at children's physical and emotional well-being. So I'm really glad that that, that word emotional was in the guidance. Um, and I think, I think we just need to get really creative about how we do that. And I, I don't think we will know entirely how to do that until our children are in front of us and we can see what they need. So I think it's, you know, obviously there's a lot of recovery planning going on I mean a, a big thing for us is play um, that's been a huge thing in our school over the last couple of years and, and it's looking at how we we still continue with um, allowing children to play and giving them free play time and um, how we can still include that in the school day and how we really promote and value um, children's play and how we can develop that into our recovery curriculum. Eileen what about you? So just what you were saying, Suzanne, the big thing for me is about the connection. Um, we've been trying to connect with our children and families all through this. So we feel we're in an OK place for the children to come back, that there's not a big kind of gap or a big space between us when they return. Um, so we'll be looking at ways to help the children to connect with each other in a safe way. And there's lots of ways of doing that. And we can use our teddies to help them do that. Our teddies will not be able to touch our teddies, so we can say, what can we do? Um, to our teddies to show them that um, something's good or um, we miss you or whatever. So, so we're using the teddies a lot. Um, and I think it's all about helping the children feel like they belong again back in the place and they feel safe in, in, in school. And if it means we've been working in the hub, Francis and myself, so we've got a bit of experience of what it's, what it's like to be in school with the social distancing. And the children, they've all got their own wee pack of things that they use. They've all got the re spaces that they go to. And I think if we recreate that and make the children feel space, so they've got their own safe space in the classroom. We've all got safe spaces the children can all use in the classrooms just now, but we'll need to take that away. But if they've got their own wee kind of, let's call it a bubble or a, a pod, their own little area they can go with. They've got their own little um, box of things that they can use, and that belongs to them. They've got their way of connecting with us and connecting with one another, if it's through like a sign language or if it's through pictures or if it's thumbs up or whatever 
um, I think it's a great chance to be really creative and just find lots of different ways to do lots of different things, including our curriculum. And, and Francis, that, that question to you, if you don't mind. Again, Eileen said we were working in the hub and that was the key workers' children from a, a huge area within West Lothian and they all came together, didn't know each other, coming to a strange school, working with a whole lot of different volunteers. But 10 weeks into this, they have formed a community, they've got great relationships, um, they've got great friendships, which they will continue, hopefully, when they go back to their own school. So we've been in the fortunate position that we've had a, a, a run through this, um, and a lot of what we've learned there we will be able to take to our own schools. But there are things like um, the connections are, have been continuing through our, our um, making videos, our teachers have been reading stories and posting it on the school blog, we've been sending messages, and we had a lovely moment last week where our parents made um, a little video of our children holding up little signs with messages on them and sent them into the school. So the connection is still there. And as we said earlier, we've got so much going on in the school, it's just who we are. It's a case of picking that back up, um, looking at the health and safety aspects of it, because there are some that we, we will have to consider um, and, and sharing that with the children so they're not coming back to a sterile, sanitised place. Um, but there are, there are reasons why we need to do things this way and if they're part of the development of that and they understand why, um, we will just have to evolve as, as we go. But I think we've got a rich source of resources and we've got staff who have worked tremendously well to maintain these connections throughout this course um, that it will take time but I think we're on a good footing. I, I want to, we've, we've talked about, um, you know, children going back to school and eventually going back to school um, north of the border. Um, what, has, what has been the, the, the positives that have come out of the situation that we've been in for the past couple of months for families uh, and children and parents in terms of connection? So, yes, they've not been at school, but, but what, have the, what have the positives out of this been, do you think? Do you know, I think that's a really interesting question. So I'm going to move us into some, a slightly edgy area, as I am wont to do. Our professional language says, um, children are missing out on school. Children are missing out on language. All the vulnerable children need to be in school. We need to be anxious about all the vulnerable families. Okay, I don't mean that we don't need to think about them. But... There's a lot of evidence coming out that a number of families have thrived under lockdown. I've seen any number of parents who've said, my child is more relaxed now that they don't have to deal with the stresses of school, that they don't have to do so many changes during the day, that they're not dealing with the loudness of the, of the dinner hall or of the anxiety of getting to school. And the reason I'm stressing that is because um, it helps us to think about what is stressful for children and for families. And to think about school as stressful environments is, is really helpful and is really legitimate, but isn't always the language that we use. So this, one of the good things that's come out of this is that it can actually help us to think more about what our children's experiences and what our parents' experiences and that reminds us that there's a whole variety of experiences that have been happening. So there will be some families for whom this has been horrendous. There's domestic abuse going on, sometimes next door. Those children will have been changed, their lives shaped, by two months of terror that they've been under. If we're not interested in their behavior and their, the emotions, in other words, that their behavior tells us something about the emotions underneath, then we miss opportunities to help those children. And, and although there's, there has been a lot of thinking about that, I want to keep contrasting that with the children for whom this has actually been a, um, a, a really positive time. We need to provide for all of those children when they come back. Every single child that comes back to school will have been changed by these times, and so will the parents. And if we are not really curious about what has happened during that time, then 
then we won't serve them. And I think schools are meant to serve. I think all public services are meant to serve. And so using the language of serving helps us to think about what our role is. So one thing that has, it has done, I think, is if we want it to do, is to help us to make us more curious. On the other hand, it's been a really hard time. I mean, I've had a hard time with lockdown. You know, it has, this has been a time of uncertainty that we've all needed to move into. So staying curious in a time of uncertainty and anxiety is a really interesting balance. But if more of us are talking about doing that, then, then more people understand that they can hold both sides. So, so Francis, Eileen and Angela, and, and, and to you, Francis, first on that, a massive balancing act for you and your staff yes. when the children come back. How are you going to tackle that? <laughs> We have time to prepare before we have your children come back. So our staff are coming back before the children. We have time to have conversations and plan and consider the best way forward. Um, we will have to be very flexible and adaptable. Um, we will also have to listen to our children and our families who um, will be coming to us with stories that you know things have gone really well or things have not gone well or things need to be considered. Um, and it's about, again, listening and planning and being responsive to the needs as we find them, because at the moment, we do not really know how we will need to respond when we go back. Um, but it's about having things in place that allow us to do that support in a supportive way, um, understanding that parents will also have anxieties about the children coming back and how are we going to manage that. So we will work together. Um, with our cluster colleagues and with our authority colleagues to plan this. But it's very much about having the staff design the correct way forward, the correct recovery plan for a particular school. Eileen, Eileen what, um, um, what, what concerns uh, m do you have uh, for your colleagues down south who may not have had the luxury of that time to prepare for next week? Oh, <laughs> that's a hard question, Gary. <laughs> Um, I suppose they just haven't had the time to prepare, they haven't had the time to um, maybe do as much as they would have wanted to do with their staff, with the parents, um, and getting things into place. Yeah, it is, it is a tough question. And, uh, and actually, if I can, before I go to, to Angela, Suzanne? Gary, if I come in there, what happens when you help adults to regulate? When, when adults feel calm, when adults don't feel stressed, when adults feel um, confident about what they're doing, then they naturally help to co-regulate children. And so one of the risks on Monday is that, it, is that if, if, um, if staff are feeling anxious, then the children will pick up on that. So for any English colleagues who are watching this, um, the calmer you can be on Monday, the more you will help your children even if the culture around you hasn't always helped you to be calm, the more you can do that for yourself, the more you help the children around you too. That's great. Eileen, if I can just come back to you and, uh, and, and, and balance up my questioning a little bit for you, because <laughs> that was a bit of a came from the, from the left a little. Um, in terms of what you'll be doing to, uh, to prepare, and I mentioned to Francis that, that you all have a real big balancing act to do for each child when they come back to school. Um, bearing in mind what Francis said, what are you thinking about in terms of you and your staff and how are you going to approach it? Um. There's a lot we have to put into place for um, the hygiene, as, as Francis had spoken about, and the safety. Um, I think, as um, Suzanne has said as well, it's about the staff feeling confident and the staff being ready to return. There's all the kind of moving of equipment and furniture and things that we need to do to make sure that's all in place. But I think it's a really exciting time as well. I really do, because I think it is a chance to look at our curriculum again and make changes. Um, I think it's another fantastic opportunity to put health and wellbeing right at the front of everything and make sure that we've got all these things in place all the time that the children need, all of the time, and not just at this current time. And Angela, what about you and your team? Yeah, I think just as, as Eileen and Francis said, it's, it's about making sure that the staff are really well supported and that their concerns are listened to um, and addressed. Um, because as, as 
Suzanne said, if they're in a good place, then, you know, they're going to be there for your children. And it's just, you know, as they said, planning this recovery curriculum that's going to be really um, flexible um, and, and just ensuring that we are um, emotionally supporting our children and their families as well. I've just looked at the time and I can't believe that we are 55 minutes through this. Um, so uh, we've got a few more things to do, uh, but a bit, before I before I wrap up with our guests, Suzanne, because I've got one more question I would like to ask them. Is there anything you, you'd like to contribute based on what the ladies have said so far? I just want to say what um, leaders I think my three guests and colleagues are this morning. They did not have to choose the language of teddy bear policies, but their courage in doing that helps other people to see in new ways. And that's why I've told their story in the book. And obviously, if people don't know their story and want to know more, it's in the book and you can find out about it. And I just hope that it ripples. So I'm really honored to have you guys here this morning and to work with you. So Francis, Eileen and uh, Angela, before before we let you you go, um, it would be great to have one piece of 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 advice or guidance or just something that you could say to people who are watching this, who are going, OK, you know, and maybe thinking about if they haven't adopted a teddy bear policy, what would you say to them to encourage them to to either implement it or at least think about it. Francis, you first. Um, for me, the resilience film is, is really helpful to, to start it off, to, to introduce the whole concept to your staff, to get the conversations going. Um, but you have to take it slowly. Um, you have to have everybody on board as much as you can. And you cannot put people under pressure to do this because as Suzanne said, Everyone needs to feel confident, knowledgeable, um, and it's not a pressured thing. Otherwise, the children pick up on that and it doesn't happen. And although Angela, Eileen and myself work together very closely on this and with Suzanne, our skills are, have similarities and differences so that we're not replicating the same thing in every school. So this is not something new. It's something you have to develop within your own school. Eileen? So, Gary, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Yes, it was just one one bit of advice that you may have to somebody who is considering adopting a, a teddy bear policy um, or thinking about it. What would you What would you say to them in in order to encourage them? I would say, be brave. It's not easy. It's hard work. It really is. Um, stick at it. Believe in yourself. Believe this is the right thing for your children and for your school because it totally is. Wonderful. And Angela, to you. Yeah, I would just I would just say like Eileen said, just yeah, just have the courage to do what you know is right and follow follow through on that. And also um just with this shift away from behaviour um, and this big focus on behaviour and more into feelings. Um, don't don't think that behaviour is actually gonna go downhill in the school because it actually <laughs> actually makes it much better. It really does make it better. Wonderful. Don't leave us just yet, ladies. Uh, Suzanne, another uh, superb uh, 60 minutes, uh, even with my little broadband dropout. I apologise again. Um, we have some thanks to do, Suzanne. Um, and I know that uh, you and your team have worked uh, incredibly hard to, to pull this together. But first of all, thank you to our guests, to Francis, to Eileen and to Angela. And uh, more power to your elbow, as they say, uh, and I hope to hear more uh, as as, it, as we go on. Mary, can I come in? Yes, can of I course. Stress, for people who think that Angela and Eileen and Francis look confident and this was easy for them, I want to stress, and I hope it's okay to say, guys, they were all nervous about coming. Okay, they were nervous about talking so to people that they don't even have in the room. So I'm just trying to highlight that that bravery sometimes it looks like ease. So that helps other people to be brave too, if you know that it took courage for them to be here this morning. Can I just show my t-shirt as well? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. 
Uh, we've also got to say uh, a big thank you to uh, West Lothian Council because all your three schools are are, are based in in West Lothian. Uh, so thank you very much to West Lothian Council too for your uh, cooperation. Seven hundred and fifty books gone so far, Suzanne, and we have more, and they are available, uh, and uh, you can you can buy them online. So what, what have we we've got them? We can we can buy them on they're on Amazon. Uh, just remind us, Suzanne. Well, that you can get them in print, in audio, online, and in ebook. And so the print copies you get from us, you can find all that out on the website. And in fact, all of that is on the website. But we just wanted to make lots of different ways for people to access this information. Uh, and uh, and your producer is uh, is sending me text messages now in big bold shouty letters saying tell people there will be links on the website available so um, so you will be able to hopefully see this uh, and uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the chat that we've been getting we will be responding to as the week goes on as well so we will capture everything because there have been lots and lots of questions um, our next sorry yep. You're, you're about to say the same thing as me, I think. That taps into the whole of the series. Is that what you're about to say? Yeah, I'll go with that. <laughs> well, you say, I'm, you, go on with what you're saying. No, it does tap into the whole of the series. Uh, and actually, in our, uh, in our next vodcast in two weeks, so make sure you get signed up when the link comes out, um, we'll be looking at long-term impact of uh, boarding school and how it helps uh, and how art helps in healing attachment wounds and that's in relation to Tony's story that you may remember if you were on the uh, if you were on the vodcast a couple of weeks ago so that will be a very very interesting session and I know that we've got some fiery guests coming up in the next couple of weeks as well which is going to be uh, an interesting debate. Here's one of the interesting things about language right so as soon as you describe something and you go next week will about the long be about the long-term impacts of boarding school lots of people might go boarding school that's nothing to do with me except that it is everything in this series is looking at how our how our physiological systems are shaped by relationships and experiences and and it just helps to show the wide variety of experiences that impact on the attachment system or the stress system so for those of you in the chat who are saying um where, where can we get more information about the emotional system and the stress system? Well, every single episode in this series is going to look at that. And we're just getting out the information. We've just put together all the guests. It'll go until the end of August. And all that information will be up on the website. And you can sign up for them every two weeks on a Saturday morning on all sorts of different topics that come out of the book. Which is the Connected Baby website. The Connected Baby website, connectedbaby.net. So let's just finish by acknowledging three young people. Um, last two couple of weeks ago, you ran a competition um, which was asking young people to send in pictures of their favourite teddies, and we had we had we had quite a few, and they were all wonderful. Um, we had we had three, didn't we, that came in from the same family. So we've got to say hello and good morning. First of all, to Mum. Hello, Mum Vicky Dale, who's watching this. We hope so. Hello, Mum. Hope you well. But in particular, I've got to say hello to Lottie, who's aged five. Uh, Noah, aged nine and Freddie, age five. They sent in their individual photographs of their teddies, which were brilliant. Uh, Dottie the Otter came in from Lottie. Uh, Noah sent in Winston the Owl, which was fantastic, I have to say. And Freddie, age five, sent in a picture of Marcel. They were, they were absolutely fantastic. So Suzanne, what are we doing for that? Well, what, they came in during the launch, and so all three of those lovely pictures of trusted friends didn't get mentioned last week and so we just wanted to mention them this week and with all the other children who were courageous enough to draw me a picture of their favorite friends <laughs> i send them all books with inscriptions and i'm going to do that for these three lovely brave young people you'll get a book a book too but we just wanted to be sure to say your names as part of tigers and teddy's live Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Francis, Eileen and Angela, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Suzanne Zedike, as always, it's a pleasure and I look forward to speaking to you in two weeks time, Saturday morning, 1030 with, a, with another different bow tie today. Until then, take care. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. 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 bye.